our society says that the person that is successful is the one that is rich and has many things. Our society teaches us that a good life is a life filled with diverse, entertaining experiences. That is the idea of a narrative that influences the way you live. A category that interprets how you see the world. You look at your life, you don't see that you've got many possessions, and you start to think to yourself, well, I must be a failure. So guys, we've, we've had to move because it's getting really rainy. Um, and what I want to talk about are sort of key aspects of the Christian faith. And the first one that I want to talk about is the idea of metanoia, which is this idea of repentance. You see, the thing is, for the Christian, this is a, a, an absolutely key theme of Christian spirituality, of what it means to be a Christian. In the book of Romans, chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, it says, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in the light of God's mercy, to offer your souls and bodies to be a living sacrifice to the Lord our God, and to offer yourselves as, uh, to, this is your act of worship, as a sensible people. And be no longer conformed to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you might know what is the perfect and pleasing will of God. So this idea is that a Christian works, walks perpetually in their faith in a state of repentance. We are walking in repentance. Repentance is not a thing that we do once. Repentance is a mindset. It's a renewing of our mind as Christians. And we do this, we do this through recategorizing things, through developing new categories of mind, by um, seeing the world in new ways according to a new narrative. It, it demands of us the evaluation of our mindset, of how we are thinking. It demands of us this idea of reflective meditation upon the self to understand what is the story we're telling ourselves. What are the axioms, the paradigms, the categories of mind by which we're interpreting the world? So that we know how our history has affected us. So we know how our lives affect us. And as we, and this is the idea of repentance, it's this idea that you have repented and that you are repenting. It's close, very closely linked to this idea of salvation. I am saved and I am being saved. So as Christians, the idea of metanoia, this idea of repentance, is an absolutely central aspect of the Christian faith. But as you go about this reflection, you will discover in your life things that we call strongholds. These are attitudes of mind, perceptions, habits, that are so deeply rooted into your understanding of yourself, you find it hard to change them. And these come in two forms, corporate and individual. So if we turn to Genesis chapter 1, verse 27. Yeah. God created man in his own image, in the image of God he created them, male and female he created them. So there is this corporate identity that we have as Christians. We have this idea of operating as a part of a greater whole. We are part of a society. We're influenced by society. So societies themselves can also have strongholds, can also have their own habits, their own traditions, their own customs that they find it difficult to change. Like the white working class has an addiction and an abuse of alcohol. We love alcohol too much in England. It is a bad habit of the white working class that then, because it's a cultural habit, expresses itself as itself, as individuals. If we read Genesis chapter 2 verse 7, we can also see that it works as an individual level as well. Then the Lord God formed man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and the man became a living being. So we operate as individuals and we operate as societies and both individuals and societies have mindsets and narratives 
that control the way that they live, that dominate the way that they live. So an important question for Christians, Deuteronomy 29, 29, yep. an important question for Christians is what is informing our narrative? What is informing the story that governs our lives, the that informs the categories by which we interpret and understand the world and by which we operate in the world? Are we, are we getting it from, are we, are we getting it from, are we getting it from, are we getting it from society? Is society giving us our categories? Now the lady asked for a, a, me to break that down very briefly, I will. So a category is, for example, this idea that there are different ethnicities. Where did we get that idea from? Who taught us that idea? Who taught us the category that there's Asian, black and white. You weren't born with it. Society has told you that there are these categories, that there are these groups. So, so, this is, so this is what I mean by a category. And society informs us of our categories. So we need to understand what is informing the narrative, informing the categories that we live by. Read Deuteronomy 29.29. The secret things belong to the Lord Yahweh our God, but the things revealed belong to us and to our sons forever, that we may observe all the words of this law. So we as Christians believe that God has spoken in history, that he has spoken to his people Israel, and Israel was the incubator through which God spoke to the world. And this was deployed through the person of our Lord Jesus Christ, and his apostles who took the new covenant into the world. So distilled within the community of the church is the truths of God, the secrets of God that are given to the church and then taken into the world, Romans 8, 6. I'm going, to, sister, thank you. I'll answer that. So as Christians, this, this church, this, this church, you're, you're jumping to assumption, sister. 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 So, I'm, guys, guys, unfortunately, I'm going to just have to raise my voice because the sister wants to jump in. So, in terms of the Christian faith, we believe that God has spoken in history and that this revelation should inform the narrative that we live by, that it informs the narrative that influences the story we tell ourselves and the categories by which we interpret the world. Now, what do I mean by church? I mean the people of God. I mean the community, the brothers and sisters of the Christian faith. Romans 8, 6. Romans 8, 6. For the mind set on the flesh is death, but the mind set on the spirit is life and peace. So the scriptures teach us that there are mindsets and that there's a mindset that is obsessed with worldly things. What kind of worldly things am I talking about? The idea, for instance, here's a category distinction. Here's how narrative influences the way you live. Our society says that the person that is successful is the one that is rich and has many things. Our society teaches us that a good life is a life filled with diverse entertaining experiences. That is the idea of a narrative that influences the way you live. A category that interprets how you see the world. You look at your life, you don't see that you've got many possessions and you start to think to yourself, well, I must be a failure. But this way of the flesh is, the, is not the Christian mindset. The Christian mindset is the ways of the spirit. It says that the measure of success is the measure of virtue. How faithful are you? How true to your word are you? How uncompromising in your morality are you? How is your ethics guided by love and hope and faith? This is the mindset of the Christian that says that you are successful. Amen. This is what the Christian faith teaches success looks like not worldly possession but the growth of virtue in your life 
the growth of your discipleship as a Christian to the Lord. If we read, so, so we've got to understand as Christians, there's a right and a wrong source. If we go to 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 7 to 16. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Seven, two yep. But we speak God's wisdom in a mystery, the hidden wisdom, which God predestined before the ages to our glory, the wisdom which none of the rulers of this age have understood. For if they had understood it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But just as it is written, things which eye has not seen and ear has not heard and which have not entered the heart of man, all these God has prepared for those who love him. For to us God revealed them through the Spirit. For the Spirit searches all things, even the depths of God. For who among men knows the thoughts of man except the spirit of the man that is within him? Even so, the thoughts of God, no one knows except the Spirit of God. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit that is from God, so that we may know things freely given to us by God, which things we also speak, not in words taught by human wisdom, but in those taught by the Spirit, combining spiritual thoughts with spiritual words. But a, mat a natural man does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, and he cannot understand them because they are spiritually appraised. But he who is a spiritual appraises all things, yet he himself is appraised by no one. For who has known the mind of the Lord in order to instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. So, these mysteries, well, let's think about it. Does the world celebrate virtue today? No. Does it uphold faithfulness over prosperity? No. Does it say that hope is more important than ambition? No. Nope. You see, the Christian mindset is the mindset of God. It is very different from the mindset of the world. The world neither knows it, nor understands it, nor values it. But we, the community of the faith, see in the cross, in the crucifixion of our Lord, the overturning of the things of the world, that that which was meek and humble and powerless became the means by which power is exercised, Amen. that the conquer that the conquered becomes the conqueror. And what does the world teach? The world teaches wealth and prosperity and experience and the God of the self or the God of the nation state. But as Christians, we teach Christ as God Amen. because through being a disciple of Christ, you understand the true values of the world. You receive that spirit of God that knows the mind of God. And note the Trinitarian language. Yes. The spirit knows the mind of the Father. Clearly, they are not the same person. Amen. Now, brothers and sisters, we as Christians uphold a different way of living. One that is not uh, obsessed with the exterior, but elevates humility and elevates the idea of faithfulness, of truthfulness, a radical truthfulness that boils down to letting your yes be yes and your no be no, with no addition and no qualification. A radical truthfulness that none of you have ever experienced in life because we live in a culture that accepts lying. We even talk about it in terms of different kinds of lies. White lies and black lies. We as Christians see that behavior is about mindset. So as Christians, you reflect upon your mindset and you renew your mind by changing the categories that govern the way you live by changing the story that governs the way you live and by changing the story that you tell yourself you change your life you redeem your life this is the idea of repentance if we turn to 1 Corinthians 8 chap chapter 8 verse 1 
Now concerning the things sacrificed to idols, we know that we all have knowledge. Knowledge makes arrogance, but love edifies. What are your idols? What do you worship apart from God? As a society, we worship the NHS. As a society, we worship the British Army. These are false gods. What, do you, what is your false god? Is it your ambition for a career? Is it your sex life? What is your ambition? What is your false god? We as Christians are in the habit of smashing the idols in our life. Yes and amen. And building up Christ in our life as the only basis, the only governing principle of our lives as his disciples. If we turn to Philippians, chapter 1, verse 9. As Christians, I'll, it's all right, let me just continue. As Christians, the best way to be a disciple of Christ is allow love to infuse your life as deeply and as widely as you can. Now here's an example of how categories and society influence you. Hollywood teaches you that love is a romantic sentiment that is soppy and weak. But the Christian faith teaches that there is no greater love than this, than he who lays down his life for his friends. Amen. So in other words, the Christian idea of love is different from our societies and cultures idea of love. We see love as a selfless action, a selfless giver of ourselves on behalf of another person. That is the Christian idea of love. It is a duty, not an emotion. It is an act of the mind and the will, not a feeling. The thing that we call love in our culture, in our society, is really sentiments of attachment, sentiments of belonging. They're not wrong. There's nothing wrong with them. Cultivate them, but don't think they are love. Love is when you give yourself to the other person. Read, bro. Philippians 1 9, yeah? Yep. And this I pray that your love may abound still more and more in real knowledge and all discernment. In real knowledge and in all discernment. You see, love and the practice of love is something that you have to think about. It's something that you say, what is the most loving thing that I can do in this situation? Love sometimes means you restrain the robber. It sometimes means that you oppose the persecutor. It sometimes means you make food for the homeless. It sometimes means you buy flowers for your mother. But you think about the practice of love. And as you think about the practice of love, you grow in your discipleship as you give over more and more of your life to love you increase upon your discipleship just ignore her sister, bro. just ignore her you just you give over more and more of your life so so no we're fine so this is what it means to grow in your discipleship. To think and build your love. So Christians, think about your mindsets. What are your obstacles to love? What are the obstacles to growing in love in your life? Because this is the mindset of metanoia, the mindset of repentance. And then you take this same example and you apply it to the other virtues like hope and chastity and justice and faith. 
and forbearance. What are the obstacles to growing in virtue in your life in these things? This is how you grow in metanoia. Another example. If we go to Mark chapter 12 verse 13. And here I'm going to stop. Mark chapter 12 verse 13. These are, these, are the, these are the keys of Christian discipleship. I've got, I've got that, I've got put in the wrong verse in my notes. Happens to the best of us. So in terms of our discipleship, we as Christians must take of our gifts and our talents, must take of our character, and through the reflection of our minds, through that practice of meditation, that discipline, of examining yourself to see if you remain in the faith, which is what the apostles command us to do. We change the categories, we change the narrative, and we grow in repentance, renewing our mind. Any questions before I move on to my next topic? Nope. Any questions before I move on to my next topic? Can I, can I speak? No, you can ask a question if you like. But I can't speak. You can speak, but I'm just going to carry on with my next topic. But you are going to wait long enough to let me speak? No. See what I mean? I'm not, I'm not, we, 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 don't, we don't owe you no, our time. We don't owe you our time. I, I feel like you call me sister one minute, but now you don't like me. I'm an intrusion on your space and your great knowledge. Okay, so I'm going to go into my next topic.